So here we are in uh, sunny-ish Limerick, beautiful Limerick. Uh, we're here with the fantastic Liam Toland. Liam, how are you doing? Superb, Shane. Uh, you're a very unusual person Thank in you. the sense that, well, you know, there's loads of sense, but in a way that you played rugby for both Munster and Leinster. And out of all the places, you were in the army and of both Dublin and Limerick, you decided to settle back in Limerick. Tell us why, what brought you down here? Um, <clears throat> Well, obviously not the sun, but definitely the sea. And we're here on the, on the River Shannon, which is particularly beautiful. Uh, it's low and quite calm today. But uh, I suppose my heart is in Limerick. Uh, I went to school in, in St. Clement's Redemptress, which is only 300 metres from here, from the Clarion Hotel. Um, but it's the engagement of the city. Uh, you can't but be engaged in something in this city. It's, it, it's a city, but it's still small enough to be managing. You know everybody. Yeah. But uh, growing up, we played every single sport. Everybody played every single sport. Yeah. Uh, in my case, I started off with the GA playing uh, Gaelic football for Clare Miners, which always gets a giggle around the place. <laughs> but that's my journey. My father's from Donegal, played uh, minor and senior football for Donegal. So we were a GA family. Yeah. But you couldn't but be sucked into rugby in, in Limerick. So I, I did 17 years in the Defence Forces and I handed in my musket. I handed in, cashed yeah. in my, my commission, which was a massive decision because um, it's a great career in its right, but I'd been overseas a couple of times to Kosovo and I'd done an awful lot of things. I was commanding officer of the 2nd Cavalry Squadron, yeah. so I did an awful lot of things that I thought that I kind of had done enough. Um, and an opportunity came to, uh, to open up a business here, uh, Homestead Senior Care. Okay. And uh, how's that going? You're in it how long now? Yeah, we sent out our first bill in January of 2009, so we okay. actually started in, in late 2008. Um, I'll never forget that first bill going out and say, will anyone even pay this? Yeah. <laughs> um, but essentially what it is, is it was very new to me. Yeah. Um, although my own parents were, are still plodding along as best they can. Many in our community here, and people yeah. you know as well, Shane, yeah. are struggling as they, as they go beyond retirement age into yeah. older age, we'll say. Just and need a little uh, bit of care. Absolutely. All right, so let's move on to the rugby. A, a, a seamless link there and uh, the, like for, the, for, Leinster's, for Leinster's ever living shame you did captain us for a few seasons yeah. so let's talk about our World Cup captain Paul O'Connell and his move and where do you think yeah. his mind is going to be at I'm like am I being compared to Paul O'Connell there well you're taller than in, me in, so that's about as much in a, in a, in a way, in a way I think I'll be compared <laughs> um, well if you just take Paul O'Connell the Limerick man yeah. He's, he's an absolute icon yeah. of, of the city and in many ways he represents what I believe is the true character of the city. The sense of going towards the danger. Yeah. These guys know no bounds. They want to go where the fire is. Yeah. And I think Paul O'Connell has brought that to a new level. In other words, there is simply nothing that that guy is afraid of. Yeah. And there's nothing he's afraid of getting into. And I think matching Paul O'Connell up with Joe Smith and his team has opened up both sets of eyes. Yeah. I think Paul, and I haven't discussed this with him, um, but I get a sense that, wow, if only this guy, Joe Smith, was in my life yeah, I know. 10 years ago, yeah. where would I be? And that's crazy a lot cons of players think considering like that. what Paul O'Connell has achieved. Yeah. Lions captain, Grand Slams, the whole lot. But still, I'm, I'm sure he's, he's grabbing each day with this opportunity. You put those two guys together, yeah. and you've got a serious packet. TV3, sole broadcasters of the Rugby World Cup in Ireland, 48 games it's going to be an absolutely amazing uh, you know event and it's so close to us no more getting up at four o'clock in the morning to have to watch a game you're going to be one of our main men over there you're going to be on ground over in England tell us a bit about the role you're going to be taking up well the first thing I think the last major event that I can recall that happened in London was the Olympics mm. and I had the good fortune to be at the Katie Taylor final Fantastic. just no strokes just yeah, got my tickets and it was Incredible to think that this event, and now in our case, the Rugby World Cup, is literally an hour away from here. Shannon yeah. Airport's only out the road. To have it so close, um, so many Irish are going to obviously go and, and, yeah. and get a part of it. I'm one of the lucky ones who's going to be there. And for those who can't go, or for whatever reason, I hope to be able to be, tell the story of what I see yeah. back in Ireland. And I think that, that rugby is a technical game. It can be very heavy in analysis. And I think that's an important part of it. Yeah. But I think it's also important to tell the story of what else is going on around the, around the pitch? We have a, a major squad, They've, they're playing all the warm-up games and uh, you know, we have a good chance, everyone's obsessed about the French game. But what do you think about this squad, but particularly with the Joe influence? How do you think we're going to get on? <coughs> the first thing is obviously the, the players will be left out. And if you look at the wingers, you look at Simon Zebo, David Trimble, there's a list of them, yeah. Fergus McFadden, uh, uh, David Carney, uh, 
Gilroy, there's yeah. a list. There's some serious players not even going to make this. Yeah. And that's a reality. And I think that's, like you go back to your World Cup time, okay, good players are left out, but not that type of no. good player. That previous management might have said, do you know what? They're just not good enough. Mm. Well, Joe Smith has actually said, actually, if you, I decide if you're good enough, and if you think you're good enough, and I don't think you are, you're out. Yeah. And that type of cutthroat thing is a nasty environment in the sense of, wow, you have to be on your toes. Mm. That's going to propel everyone to be at their best. In other previous World Cups, in 07 in particular, we made mistakes that you could point to and go, like in 07, it was the preparation beforehand, it was the place they were. And I don't think Joe will allow that to happen this time. Yeah, but also remember, a lot of those players have stepped up and take ownership. And I think, again, go back to our time, you know, the elite players might have been led a little bit by the coaches, yeah. a little bit. Whereas I think the likes of Paul O'Connell and Rob Carney and these serious, like they're qualified people. Yeah. I think they're also dictating the tempo and they're saying, listen, we want to win this. Yeah. And I think it's a more, like definitely Joe's leading, but they're feeding into it at the same time. Totally, we look forward to it. It's going to be great. Thanks very much. And I have to say, secretly, I'm delighted you stayed here as opposed to Dublin.